mystery, danger, splendor, adventure. Join us now for 30 years of National Geographic Specials. In the beginning, it was an orb of fire. In time, a crucible of creation would forge molten rock into continents. As the land cooled, gathering clouds burst forth. And the cycle of water would make this world unique in the solar system, and perhaps beyond. Third orbit from the sun, the Earth. To better understand this home planet is a primary goal of the National Geographic Society. For the past 30 years, its television specials have captured the sights and sounds of Earth's many wonders. The magnificent pageant of wildlife, the dazzling diversity of humankind, the puzzle of our origins, how a humble cousin to the apes became the only species with the curiosity to fathom the world and all that is in it. For three decades, National Geographic filmmakers have explored the story of life on Earth. The tale begins here. In Africa's Namib Desert, one of the harshest environments on Earth, strange creatures withstand the elements and each other. In the endless round of predation, a female wasp has found the burrow of a trapdoor spider. She will move incredible amounts of sand to get to her prey. As its first defense, the spider has dug its burrow on the slope of a dune face. So as fast as the wasp digs, the sand slides back into the hole. Often the wasp, which may have been searching for days, simply gives up. But this time, the spider is uncovered. It has powerful jaws, the wasp a sting. The outcome is by no means certain. In addition, this spider has developed a most extraordinary method of escape. It forms its legs into a circle and cartwheels down the dune. In a Costa Rican rainforest, young basilisk lizards must evade a... Though he belongs to a race of giants, an elephant calf is vulnerable when he becomes separated from his family. 
He wanders into the company of lions. Before he can turn, the juvenile is locked in a deadly game. But this time, innocence is matched by inexperience. The lions are young and seem more intent on experimenting than killing. Lions often prey on the weak, but this calf is lost, not ailing. A determined opponent with a thick hide, not easy to penetrate. But soon he tires and the lions close in for the kill. Quite suddenly, the experiment is over. The lions are exhausted and lose interest. Practice will make perfect for the novice hunters. It's a lucky break for the calf. In Okefenokee Swamp on the Georgia-Florida border, a corn snake goes to amazing lengths for a meal. A superb climber, it can raid bird nests 30 feet above the ground. The woodpecker has a unique defense. It nests only in old pine trees, and its constant pecking causes a pungent resin to coat the tree trunk around its nest hole. The snake seems to glide effortlessly straight up the tree. The woodpecker can only wait and watch. Eggs or baby birds inside the woodpecker's nest are seemingly easy prey. But now the resin comes into play. To the snake, it's a powerful irritant. Frequently, it stops the snake entirely. Even if the snake persists, it still tries to avoid contact with the resin. Often the snake ends up retreating the hard way. Such moments of threat and drama frequently interrupt the tranquility of Okfinoki. The predator in one situation can become prey in the next. Night falls in Africa. Carnivores come to life. As blood flows, bitter rivalry is aroused. As always, the kill is watched from the shadows. Quickly, the hyenas identify the lions and realize that the males are absent. The noise attracts the entire southern clan. As the numbers mount up, the battle begins. The numbers are too great. The battle, too fierce. Oh, my God. 
from the safety of the trees, they can only watch their kill disappear. Pray. The daily struggle for survival is a powerful drama, but nature's true miracle is quiet and humble, selfless and sublime. The creation of new life. As day follows night and winter leads to spring, a great rhythm pulses through every living creature. Its meaning is universal, its urge irresistible. At the water hole, a lone male suddenly feels the awakenings in his body. It is the time of his must. Like the new dawn, this feeling is fresh and vital. He can take on anything. Another bull has the same feelings of elation today and is also ready to confront the world. In his season, a male may challenge his peers for territory, or the favors of a female. Prospective mates convey their willingness through simple touch or elaborate courtship. Displays may be bold or subtle. Caresses tender or frantic. All are very... The mating behavior of these black beetles is quite unusual. Three males pursue a much larger female. It seems to take all three to subdue the female for the mating to be successful. How life began on Earth remains a mystery, but each birth forges a new link in a miraculous chain that spans nearly four billion years. With infinite variety, one generation makes a living commitment to the next. During high water, the arowana, or water monkey, spawns. The male broods the fertilized eggs in his huge mouth, and here, the young are born.
Now, when they are somewhat developed, he lets them out to feed on microorganisms such as algae and the larvae of crustaceans and insects. The yolk sac from which they develop is also a source of energy. The father himself will not feed for three to four weeks until the young are grown and on their own. He lives off the fat reserves of his own body. If the young do not return on their own, the father goes after them and scoops them up, each and every last one. Helpless infant, devoted mother. Theirs is one of the strongest bonds in nature. But young things must grow up, and the indulgence of parents cannot last. At a kill, lion cubs get no special treatment. They must fight for every scrap. Adults seize the best of the spoils, and as their bellies are filled, harmony is restored. Cubs must make a fierce claim to any leftovers. In most animals, youth is a time of learning. By trial and error, by imitation, and in the sheer delight of play. From a primordial spark, life evolved into a vast and intricate web that embraces every corner of the globe. But one creature would stand alone, a creature unlike any other. Tool user, fire tamer creator of language, cave painter, myth maker, weaver of dreams. The kaleidoscope of human culture veils a simple truth. We all share a common origin, locked in a remote and misty past. What creature first turns stone into power? When did it develop the intelligence to wonder, who am I? Where did we come from? Oh, no. 
To explore these questions, the National Geographic Society long supported the work of anthropologist Louis Leakey. To prove that Africa was the cradle of humanity, he scoured the terrain of northern Tanzania and settled on a site at Olduvai Gorge. It was here that in 1931, we first found examples of simple tools like this, just a water-worn pebble with a jagged cutting edge. Stone tools that go back to a very, very remote past in time, nearly three times as old as anything previously found. Who were the men who made these tools? Where did they live and how did they live? And that was a problem that Mary and I went out to look for. We wanted the answer. Who were these men? Mary Leakey, his wife and collaborator, shared this single-minded pursuit. After 28 years of fieldwork, a skull, not fully human, but surely a distant cousin, and nearly two million years old. Named Zinjanthropus, the Leakey's find would stun the scientific world. Like his parents, Richard Leakey has an exceptional talent for finding fossils. His excavations near Lake Turkana in Kenya yielded the most complete skeleton of an early human ancestor ever found. This boy was about 12 when he died, more than one and a half million years ago. His species, Homo erectus, is a direct ancestor to our own so nearly human, so very old. To put a face on our ancestors goes beyond strict science. Sculptor John Gerci works with a replica skull based on fossils three million years old. Placing the eyes is often a special moment. I base the position of the eyes on scientific data, but there's often a mystical side of it as well. That is often the moment where I begin to feel that I'm being watched by the thing I'm working on, that it is not so much a thing of clay and plaster, but is actually a living being. Gertie draws on his detailed knowledge of human and ape anatomy. Still, the final result often takes him by surprise. He brings to life the startling gaze of a creature whose descendants would evolve a new sense of self and leave their mark upon the world in profound ways. More than any species, humans would come to marshal the forces of nature, altering the landscape, domesticating plants and animals, laying the groundwork for civilization. A fascination with the past drives archaeologists to decipher early history. One tragic chapter dates back to 79 AD. The Roman town of Herculaneum flourished unsuspecting at the foot of a sleeping giant. Mount Vesuvius erupted one August day, spewing a sky-high column of pumice and ash. Around midnight, the column suddenly collapsed. A fiery avalanche descended on Herculaneum at more than 60 miles an hour. Terrified residents ran for their lives, hoping to escape by sea. They were overtaken on the beach. In a cloud of scalding ash, they suffocated. Clutched in the final embrace, these were perhaps friends, or even family members. For nearly 2,000 years, the fate of the Herculaneans remained a dark secret. 
When excavations revealed the skeletons, physical anthropologist Dr. Sarah Beisel was invited to the site. Here she gathers touching details of the victim's final moments. As she ran to her doom, one woman carried a treasure in gold. I think she must have had them in her purse, since her arm is off in another direction. Her oil lamp was snuffed out as quickly as her own breath. In a fragment of pelvic bone, Beisel reads the life story of a young Roman woman. She was a uh, vente, uh, vente sette anni, due tre bambini. She was 27 and had two, perhaps three children. From that little bone, <laughs> all that news. Beisel's analysis of the bones is one of many archaeological projects supported by the National Geographic Society. Others delve into the ancient civilizations of Mesoamerica. Mute for a millennium, the lost kingdoms of the Maya now speak to us across the ages. Wow. New discoveries reveal a vibrant and complex culture. At a site in Honduras, cameras record the moment as archaeologists unearth relics buried in a temple pyramid 1,300 years ago. This is a black kind of... No ordinary blades. These were chipped from flint, the firestone, and were probably used only in ceremony. Their beauty and mystery touch a chord in archaeologist Ricardo Agurcia. You try not to forget to uh, you know, take your pictures, take your measurements, and at times you forget to think about it and to think the fact that it's human beings that did this a long time ago and that when they did it, uh, this was very important to them. I'm, I'm touched by it, I really am. And it's a special feeling doesn't happen every day. Five hundred years ago, Spanish missionaries would make note of the Maya passion for ritual. It is a practice shared by every culture on Earth. Prayer and song, pomp and ceremony, life's great passages are observed. One of World War II's bloodiest battles was fought in Stalingrad, the city now renamed Volgograd. Here, a giant statue representing Mother Russia salutes the fallen. In 1976, a National Geographic film crew was granted unprecedented access to the former Soviet Union. This is a rare glimpse of Victory Day, May 9th, a day of remembrance. Every year, millions travel to this hall to pay their respect seeming to struggle toward the sun from the depths of the earth. A huge hand holds an eternal flame in tribute to the thousands of heroes whose names line the walls.
Many appeals for peace were made this day. None more eloquent than a hand-scrawled note to the National Geographic camera team from Ivan Musatov. He wrote, I ask you and all the American people, the people of Lincoln, protect the peace, for that is bread and life, blood and family. As if seeking eternal life, the great hall is never closed. Tape-recorded voices singing Schumann's Träumerei never still. And every day, every hour, a rigid and precise changing of the guard. faces reflect their heritage. A thousand years of suffering, climaxed by a war that took 20 million of their lives, almost 12% of the country's total population. Scarcely a family was untouched. Passed along to new generations, the memories are not allowed to die. In the acknowledgement of death, the human spirit is exalted, and life of necessity goes on. In the old city of Jerusalem, the union of man and woman is cause for joyous fanfare. The bride of European ancestry carries on her groom's family tradition. She wears the elaborate jewelry and costume the Zadoks lend to bridal parties for a ceremony called the Chena that accompanied every Jewish wedding in Yemen. The Chena, from which the festivity derives its name, has long been used as a talisman of good luck. If the Chena applied to the hands of the bride and groom remains in the morning, their wedding will take place. In a city divided by 3,000 years of strife, two become one, and love scores a small victory. In a rainforest in Cameroon, a baby girl is born to a family of Baka, called pygmies by the outside world. Soon, the age-old drama of sibling rivalry will arise. Her hands are no larger than a thumbnail. Her shoulders from tip to... A culture's faith in the future shines bright in the promise of children. Childhood is a time of learning. In Bali, 11-year-old Wayan Mastri pursues studies in two languages, one Indonesian, one Balinese. Equally important to her education is the practice of an ancient discipline. Every Saturday night, Mastri and the others are transformed from schoolgirls into court dancers. 
Legong Kraton, its story drawn from 13th century Java, was once performed only in royal palaces. Traditionally, Legong is danced by girls who have not yet reached the age of puberty. In Bali, traditions are alive, imparted by one generation to the next. Legends of the past cast shadows on the present. Myth and magic infuse every aspect of daily life. All is illuminated by the same bright beacon. But in Australia, the longest unbroken culture the world has ever known is fading away. For more than 40,000 years, the Gagaju people have seen themselves as custodians of the land. Now, only a handful of elders still practice the old ways. They honor a single life force that dwells in plant, animal, human, and the earth itself. Many younger Gagaju have lost their Aboriginal heritage, but Jonathan Yaramana seeks a link with his past. Guided by the elders, he learns their timeless wisdom. Jonathan hopes to save an endangered culture. He leaves a gentle mark upon the land. Around the world, our tie to nature is breaking. How far we have come, how far will we go? Left to our own devices, nature maintains an exquisite balance. Nowhere is this more tangible than in a tropical rainforest, the most alive place on Earth. Half the world's living species make their home in this green universe, each a marvel of adaptation. Countless species here could not survive anywhere else, but millions will be extinct before scientists have even identified them. Because rainforests, like so many wild places, are under attack. One aggressive species claiming dominion over the Earth. The cost of this arrogance has been devastating. But a new ethic is emerging, fueled by the conviction that every species has the right to be. In 1960, a young English woman named Jane Goodall fulfilled a childhood dream to live among wild animals in Africa. 
Her study of the chimpanzees of Tanzania would make scientific history. Jane was sent here by anthropologist Louis Leakey, who felt her observations would shed light on the behavior of early humans. For months, the apes fled her every approach. But Jane's patience and calm persistence would eventually win their trust. The chimps very gradually came to realize that I was not dangerous after all. I shall never forget the day after about 18 months when, for the first time, a small group allowed me to approach and be near them. Finally, I had been accepted. I think it was one of the proudest and most exciting moments of my whole life. Jane would compile an astonishing profile of the animals so like ourselves. During the rainy season, chimps seek out winged termites as a tasty treat. They know that termites are hidden within the nest. Jane would observe that the apes also know how to get at the insects, using a stem of grass and remarkable ingenuity. In defense of their nest, the termites grip onto the grass. And with utmost care, the chimp gently draws them out. As a stem becomes bent, the chimp breaks off the end to make it work more efficiently. Sometimes a leafy twig is selected, but first it must be stripped of its leaves. In these actions, modifying natural objects for a specific purpose, the chimp is not only using, but actually making tools. Tool using always used to be considered a hallmark of the human species. When Louis Leakey first heard about tool using at Gombe, he got extremely excited and said, now we have to redefine man, redefine tool, or include chimpanzees with humans. Jane was also the first to report that chimps include large prey in their diet. She saw them hunt collectively and bring down monkeys, young antelopes, and bush pigs. And, to her dismay, she found that chimps, like humans, can turn against their own kind. Over four years of what can only be called warfare, the males of one community killed all but a few members of a smaller group nearby. But if chimps provide a dim reflection of our own distant origins, we should also remember their deep-seated need for reconciliation, their caring and compassion. Thanks in part to grants from National Geographic, Jane's is the longest study of any wild animal group now in its fourth decade. Today, Jane travels the world as a tireless crusader for the conservation of wild chimpanzees. She fears that for them, time is running out. In this century, an exploding human population has become the single greatest threat to life on Earth. Not since the demise of the dinosaurs some 65 million years ago has the world witnessed such a dying off. The world of our making is hostile to wild things. Yet we expect the wilderness to welcome us. In America's national parks, conflicts between people and wildlife too often lead to a tragic outcome.
Concerned about the fate of the grizzly in Yellowstone National Park, twin brothers Frank and John Craighead conducted the pioneering scientific study of the great bear. Among the first to sedate a bear for handling, the Craigheads perfected their technique through trial and error. As work continues on number 36, John Craighead sees that the bear appears to be shaking off the effects of the drug. He must keep close watch on its breathing and eye movements for signs of premature recovery. Well, mm. let's, uh, let's get a... The, the team prepares to make a plaster cast of the grizzly's paw. Its size is another indication of age. Uncertain of how the bear is reacting to the drug, John wonders whether to risk another injection. Too much might be harmful. Concerned as much for the bear's safety as his own, John decides against another dose. The team will have to complete the work as quickly as possible. Breathing faster, I'm better at watching that. Now the drug is quickly losing its effect. Number 36 will not hold still much longer, and John cancels other planned experiments. There is time only to complete the impression and perhaps place a tag in the grizzly's ear. Today, the Craigheads remain outspoken about the need to protect the grizzly bear, a threatened species in the lower 48. Some wild places seem beyond the reach of humans, haunted by beasts that inspire terror. But poachers once ventured freely into the Okefenokee Swamp to slaughter the alligator for its exotic skin. In 1937, the swamp was made a national wildlife refuge with stiff laws to protect the huge reptiles. To biologist Kent Vliet, these are fascinating animals. At an alligator farm near the swamp, his studies bring him eye to eye with his subjects. We learned early on in our research that we needed to get off the boardwalks and go down and look at alligators at an alligator's eye level. Alligators communicate to each other visually by the way they hold their bodies out of the water. And we got down into the water to better understand how alligators are talking to each other in a visual sense. I look for animals that are obviously directing themselves toward me as aggressive animals. The way they tilt their head, how high they hold their body out of the water are all indications if they're being aggressive or not. Not all the animals that come toward me are aggressive. Many are curious, but I still have to treat them all about the same. I can't let them get too close to me. I carry a large, uh, about five foot long cypress pole with me. And if an animal does get too close, I just nudge it away and try to keep it out of, out of strike range. Vliet's experience helps dispel age-old myths of alligators as mindless killers. 
he creates for them a whole new image. Typically, the animals we fear most are those we understand the least. Few inspire such terror as this monster of the deep. But statistics reveal that sharks seldom live up to their reputation as vicious man-killers. The truth is, sharks are far more likely to be our victims. Every year, fishermen reap the bounty of squid runs in the coastal waters of the Eastern Pacific. It's hard work, and the men tolerate no competition. Here, the shark is considered a hated rival, to be shot and killed on sight. For a few daring scientists, this is a rare opportunity to get close to feeding sharks. Zoologist Bob Johnson is one of them. It was, it was very disorienting in that at night, you didn't know which way was up always. If you were balanced out correctly underwater, um, up wasn't always up. And because of the squid situation, they may be thick above you or they may be thicker below you. And everything was oriented towards the light rather than towards the surface. So it was very awkward at times. You'd see the sharks coming underneath, and you'd finally try and get in. And of course, the instant you get in, you're blinded, and you can't see them anywhere. And when you do see them, they're right in front of you all over. Uh, they'd be racing past you, eating gulps of squid. They'd come out of the corner of your eye as you're turning and, and watching for these animals, because you couldn't keep them one direction. You had to consistently turn in the water to watch in all directions. And they weren't attempting to bite us. They were attempting only to feed on the, on the squid. But if you got your arms or your legs, or your body in the wrong place at the wrong time, you can very easily get bit. For millions of years, sharks roamed the oceans unchallenged. Now their domain has been invaded by those who would destroy them and those who fight to save them. The wild has become a battleground where conservationists wage a war against time and indifference. Wildlife needs more than just protection. It needs direct human help. All too many species survive by our consent alone. For better or for worse, we have become the keepers of the wild. With admirable determination and a research grant from National Geographic, primatologist Berute Galdikas was just 25 when she embarked on a daunting expedition into the remote rainforests of southern Borneo. Here, Birute began a dual mission, to study the wild orangutan and to rehabilitate young captive orangs like Majid. Majid was the 12th orangutan to join our camp. All were orphans. Their mothers were killed so that the youngsters could be taken and sold as pets, some worth as much as $5,000 on the black market. They had never known life in the wild. It was my hope that we could prepare them to survive on their own in the jungle. Here they come. For Birute, the young orangs pose a unique problem. No! One thing she understands all too well about the rehabilitants, discipline has no effect at all. 
Unlike most other primates, the young orang is never disciplined by his mother in the wild. Perhaps because orangs must lead a solitary life, there is no need for social rules, no codes for group behavior. Don't you wish you were less charming? Problem being mother to a pile of apes. <laughs> I sure do. The single overriding natural law appears to be help yourself. Uh, uh, uh. This is why you're doomed to the trees. What do you want, Mio? Huh? Now that was unfair, Sigito. Though she is a scientist and the rehabilitants interrupt her work in the forest, there are times when Birute has mixed emotions. Mine. Not yours. Mine. She hopes that someday they will all return to the wild. Still, they will be missed. Birute's work continues to this day a lifelong quest to save both the orangutans and their threatened rainforest home. A strand of jewels scattered across the Pacific, an enticing vision of tropical paradise. Once protected by 2,000 miles of ocean, Hawaii is under assault. One quarter of all U.S. endangered species are found here. 70% of Hawaii's native birds are extinct. The very fabric of this island ecology is unraveling. Its plight is embodied in the Brigamia, a species of flowering plant that clings to life here. The island of Molokai. Up here, an insect is missing. Something is supposed to pollinate these bizarre plants. But the natural pollinator may be extinct, or so rare that the plants need help. A moth could easily flutter from flower to flower, but for humans, the task is not so easy. Got a couple other plants over here, Ken. This one's kind of hiding back in the bush. It's, it's got buds on it, just a few, very early. This one's gonna be flowering for quite a while. Now, field biologists are the pollinators, and they must accomplish their task perched on the tallest sea cliffs in the world. One moth stand-in is collecting pollen. Another delivers it. The natural pollinator has never been seen, so its identity remains a mystery. Meanwhile, the plants here may not survive without perpetual human help. And how long can this go on? No alarm bell sounds when a species is lost, an estimated six every hour. But with each extinction, the foundation of life grows weaker. And so, the keepers go on fighting, each in his own way. Near Canterbury, England, the historic estate called Howlett's has become safe haven for endangered animals. This unusual sanctuary is the consuming passion of gambling club owner John Aspinall. Well, I think the secret ingredient is respect. One has to respect the animals. And I have a deep respect in the sense that I admire and consider many great mammals superior to the human being. Open to the public, Howlitz is renowned for the world's largest captive population of gorillas. To Aspinall, they're like family. To me, it's instinctive. 
to behave as a gorilla would behave. In fact, they've influenced me more in my life than I've influenced them. And the strength they have is um, really quite astonishing. I mean, I suppose a 400-pound male gorilla in his prime would probably have the strength of seven or eight Olympic weightlifters. We have one band now of 16 or 20, and in 10 years, we'll have two bands of 16 or 20. And in 25 years, I reckon here, we'll have 60 or 70 gorillas here in three different bands. And at that point, if there is stability in West Africa, political stability, then we could siphon them back to the land that we stole from them. So there is a grand design, a purpose. It might be described as a romantic dream. I hope it isn't a romantic dream. I'm an optimist and a gambler, so I think that it might happen. It's a long shot, and a long shot is better than no shot. Aspinall is banking on a brighter future, but for now, turmoil in Africa still threatens the great ape. Ultimately, the salvation of wildlife will not come without sacrifice. More than any individual, Diane Fossey personified this sad truth. Her years of painstaking observation in Rwanda would dispel the age-old myths and reveal to the world the shy, unaggressive creature she came to know so well. Getting ever closer to the animals by imitating their behavior, Fossey would find one to be the most gentle and trusting of all. One animal who was very prone to spend a great deal of time near me was Digit. And I think of this because he has no peers within his group, that he was so attracted to me. He was very curious and always very anxious to come forward and investigate things like uh, cameras, thermoses, notebooks, or gloves. The special tour went on. A meadow near her cabin became a cemetery. Finally, Diane herself was brutally murdered, probably by vengeful poachers. She was laid to rest beside her beloved Digit. Today, others continue Fossey's work, but the fate of her mountain gorillas remains in doubt. Though we abuse and exploit them, we remain irresistibly drawn to our fellow creatures. Increasingly, tourist dollars suggest that wildlife might be worth saving. But our best hope may lie in the education of a new generation and a growing reverence for life in all its forms. Let us celebrate our kinship with all the wild things and spare ourselves the unbearable loneliness of their vanishing.
Terra Incognita, unknown territory. Not long ago, these words evoked the mystery of unmapped continents, vast and forbidding. Then a breed of men and women called explorers would open untold frontiers to us. In 1917, one of the first National Geographic expeditions to be documented in motion pictures explored a rare freak of nature, the Valley of 10,000 Smokes in Alaska. This bizarre landscape was the aftermath of a gigantic volcanic explosion several years before. In this nightmare world, superheated steam hissed from millions of vents and often, it seemed, the ground itself was alive. Scientists attempted to explore the larger fissures, but barely escaped being boiled alive. Such bold exploits are the heart and soul of the National Geographic Society. Founded over a century ago to increase and diffuse geographic knowledge, the Society has supported scientists and trailblazers everywhere. From the first glimpses of the ocean deep, to a soaring view from the stratosphere, National Geographic captured the thrill of discovery in the pages of its well-known magazine. For millions of armchair travelers, the publication became their eyes on the world. Then, in 1965, the society braved a new medium, color television. The first National Geographic special chronicled the extraordinary adventure of the first Americans to conquer Mount Everest. One o'clock in the afternoon, May 1st. Jim Whitaker and Nawang Gambu set foot on top of the world. They plant two flags, the stars and stripes, and the colors of the National Geographic Society. Buffeted by fierce winds, another team would take the first motion pictures ever shot from the highest point on Earth. Americans on Everest made television history, receiving the highest ratings to that date for a documentary. Since then, the specials have featured a gallery of remarkable explorers. The National Geographic Society supported pioneering efforts by the man who launched an era of deep sea adventure, Captain Jacques Yves Cousteau. I have long felt that undersea exploration is not an end in itself, although it is spiritually rewarding merely to be an onlooker. To enter this great unknown medium is the privilege of our era. In a project called Conshelf 3, an underwater habitat was home to six men for three weeks at a record depth of 328 feet. Due to the extreme pressure, the oceanauts breathed oxygen mixed with helium, a blend that wreaked havoc on their vocal cords. Allô, Laban, on va franchir les passes maintenant. It took several days for them to understand each other's squeaky falsetto. Their bodies adapted to the pressure, but daily life was hardly normal. Helium diffuses heat, and water for coffee never boiled, though heated to 300 degrees Fahrenheit. The oceanauts gave up smoking. Tobacco would not stay lit. 
Perhaps the greatest nuisance, helium dulled their senses of taste and smell. The oceanauts found little to savor in their meals, prepared and pre-cooked by a Parisian chef. The subtleties of French cuisine simply escaped them. Still, according to one diver, caviar is caviar, helium or not. Outside the habitat was an eternal bone-chilling night, gloom enough to intimidate even the most seasoned diver. Oceanaut Philippe Cousteau would write in his diary, As soon as I have cleared the sphere, I am struck by the absence of the surface. A total absence, felt like a chill. Darkness covers us like a shroud. My searchlight beam disappears in all directions, except on a flat and gray bottom. I must find ways to fight the cold and forget my fright. The oceanauts measured the effects of artificial light on aquatic life and collected bottom samples to test for pollution. They repaired a dummy oil rig in less time than workers on land, proving that humans can live and work on the sea floor. Conshelf 3 marked a milestone in undersea exploration. Geologist Robert Ballard was part of the team who discovered hot water vents on the floor of the Pacific Ocean. At a depth of 8,000 feet, darkness is total. Temperatures just above freezing. Do you see that white stuff along the edge of the rocks? That's spaghetti. When you see that, you know you're getting close to a vent. For decades, scientists assumed that without sunlight, little life could exist here. They were dramatically wrong. Where two huge plates of the Earth's crust pull apart, warm, mineral-rich water seeps through, and life abounds. My god, look at that. Isn't that fantastic? It must be at least eight, ten feet tall. And look at how many there are. Look at all that material in the water. It's just like a soup. You don't see this much life in shallow water. The smallest color video camera for its time would record the first close-up images of these bizarre life forms, members of an ecosystem sustained by chemicals rather than sunlight. It is the most important discovery about life in the deep sea in 100 years. Landing their tiny plane nearby, the Bartlett's would film a sight few have ever. These rare desert elephants are nomads, sometimes cross. There's more. I've got a long walk tonight. Over the years, exploration has become the Bartlett's way of life. Inspired by the romance of another time, four young men seek adventure along the Yukon River. In 1897, throngs of prospectors passed this way, lured by Klondike gold. Today, a new generation retraces their route. We've traded off the feelings of contentment that a person might have when he's, you know, a little ways into adulthood. Maybe he's getting along in 30, maybe a little more, maybe a little less. We've traded off a lot of those contentments for wings, freedom. We're free. 
if tomorrow we want to take off over that hill and, and go until whenever we can do it. And that, that's the payoff. Okay. There's, there she is. And you can already see where it's already got a whirlpool going right in there. The fast currents and narrow channels of Five Finger Rapids will put the raft and the oarsman to the ultimate test. Looking pretty bad, boys. Yeah. Now well, you give me a hand on the sweep. Go ahead, Keith! Go ahead, Keith! Craig! Push him this way. Watch the logs. Forget that, Paul. The challenge of the rugged outdoors appeals to many explorers. Others are drawn to places where nightmares are born. Underground caves harbor a dark, forbidding universe. But in the United States alone, 16,000 caving enthusiasts seek out this underworld. The sport attracts a surprising cross-section of adventurers. For nine-year-old Leah Brown, getting into a cave is half the fun. Um, I like the deep pits because when they're deep, you get to go fast more. That's why I like the deep pits. Because the short ones, you don't get to go fast very long. See, when you're going fast, it's real quick to get to the bottom if they're short. But when they're long pits, you get to go real fast for a long time. The first time I did it in a pit, it was only a 90-foot pit. And I didn't get scared. I don't get scared very easily. I like going fast. When I go down fast, um, the floor is real tiny, and then it starts getting bigger and bigger. And I like to watch that. For three decades, the National Geographic television specials have celebrated the spirit of exploration. To seek out the unknown. To see things in a new light. To change the world for the better. risk everything for a dream. As the last untouched places on Earth are mapped and charted, we enter a new era. To preserve this precious planet and all that is in it will be our greatest challenge and the greatest exploration of all. Thank you.
We hope you have enjoyed this presentation from the National Geographic Video Library. Hey gang, spins the name and rocking round the globe's the game. National Geographic is proud to present Really Wild Animals, a wild new home video series created especially for kids with a very special host. It's me, Spin, your global guide. You'll marvel at the magnificent jungle in Swing and Safari. You'll flip at the wonders down under. And you'll make a big splash with some fishy friends in Deep Sea Dive. Just listen to what the critics are saying. Magnificent footage, songs, and information. Everything you'd expect and more. Kid-friendly to the extreme. It's also supremely educational. The videos entertain and quench the curiosity of young explorers. And grab your gear for even more adventures. It's hot. It's green. It's raining. It's the totally tropical rainforest. And you are there for the action. Take a walk on the wild side with the animals of amazing North America. The creatures of Asia will amaze you. You are on your way for astounding adventures in Asia. Whoa, let's have an instant replay on that. Hang on, Spin. There's more ahead. If you think you've seen some wild music videos, take a look at this. Hey, young thing. It's time, it's time, it's time to get up. Young thing. Smile for the camera. It's the quality you expect from National Geographic, but with a brand new spin. Spin you later. Now, kids can experience the animal adventures of a lifetime with really wild animals. New from National Geographic. <laughs> <laughs>